A reader lives a thousand lives before he dies. The man who never reads lives only one. Come into the reading room, all you lovers of language and literature. This is the place for those of us who believe that reading is essential as we seek to rise above the ordinary. And the reading room contains a host of extraordinary people, leading lights of the written word. Authors, literary critics, columnists and ideas people will tantalize your minds with their wordplay while discussing the ideas and worldviews that form our wonderful literary milieu. Come step into a world of magic, the place of undiscovered treasures, a room of reading. Warm welcome to the reading room. Yes, we're back in it again. I'm Melanie Walker, and today we're going on a, a literary as well as a mental journey. And it's a mental journey of journeys, a physical journey. People sometimes think about places of going to a place just to go and see what's there, but they never really think about how that place may affect them in the long run. And if you come from South Africa and you go overseas, a lot of the time, you're still hankering to come home. Even if you weren't born in South Africa, you've been here for a long time. It is something that sits in your soul. Is it like that in other places in the world? Well, I don't know. Let us set off together on a series of journeys around South Africa with an old kit bag full of books instead of maps to guide us. And that is the tagline from the brand new book called Place, South African Literary Journeys from Justin Fox. And thanks very much for joining us. It's great to be with you, Melanie. Yeah, it's, I've been following what you've been doing writing-wise for quite a long time now, because this isn't your first book, is it? It is, in fact, number 24. And what have all the other books been about? I've been a jack-of-all-trades and master of none. I've done novels, literary novels and popular novels, poetry books, children's books, coffee table books, guide books, anthologies and lots of travel books and so, something on navy as well old sailing ships or something yeah there's yes. a there's a, a series of south, of south african second world war naval novels mm-hmm. uh and i'm on number 3 of those so the first was cape raider that came out yes. 3 years ago the wolf hunt uh, wolf hunt came out last year and the next one is on its way so are you now primarily an author or do you do other stuff as well? I'm just getting that out the stand before we see. Are you a professional traveler or are you like what? I'm now a full-time author. Until COVID struck, I was more a journalist and less an author. I was editor of Getaway Magazine until until COVID struck, until mm-hmm. May 2020 is when I resigned. And now I've committed myself almost exclusively to to being an author, but I'll still pick up any travel journalism assignment that's going. If anybody asks me to go anywhere, I drop everything, drop the the, the author nonsense and and hit the road. And go and actually earn an honest dollar. <laughs> well, <laughs> <I'm> honest <joking. laughs> But I was, I remember when you, you resigned from Getaway, I was like, oh no, that's really not good because I really enjoyed what, what you were doing there. But did that lend itself basically to the idea for this book, Place? This book place has been going for 15 years, so it's been a long, slow project. So it, it was it was happening while I was at Getaway. Mm-hmm. The first trip was Herman Charles Bosman in 2008. I took my mother to go and walk in the footsteps of Wormskalk Lawrence, mm-hmm. and that sort of was the trigger. And I and I didn't think it was going to last 15 years. It's been a long, slow project. But every every 18 months or so, I've done another literary figure and gone on another long walkabout trip. So it's been a, a long, slow brew, this one. And um, I'm just very pleased it's done and I can move on to the next project. But it is such an amazing concept, quite frankly. I mean, when I, when I first saw it, I wasn't quite sure what it was about. And then I went... Okay, let's see. And then, of course, you, you sent it through to me. And then I got buried in it. And I was like, no, I'm going to not watch anything on TV for a long time. No more podcasts. I'm going to just read now because this is so exciting, especially as I love books and I love South African writing. And you've gone in, as you said, the footstep, not only of Bosman, but how many other authors? There are nine, nine authors. And I start with Olive Schreiner in the 1860s. And that's in the Eastern Cape. Yeah, and I end with Stephen Watson, Cedarberg, and that's contemporary. And I kind of try and spread it through the 150 years of South African literature, and I try and spread it all around the country so that there's a bit of the Lowfelt with Jock of the Bushfelt and a bit of the Waterberg with uh, Eugene Marais and a bit of the Madikwe area with 
Herman Charles Brosman and then the Karoo with mm. J.M. Kutsia. So I wanted a little bit of all the different South African landscapes and to spread it over 150 years and to use classic books that, that readers would be very familiar with. Like Story of an African Farm, which is set yeah. down near Craddock. Near and Craddock, course, yes. I'm an ex-kind of Eastern Cape person too. I went to school down in the area, so I'm very aware of that area. Love the story. Love the way that it's all coming together in this as well. Because it is a thing that you think, hang on a second, I was up in the bush and on the way back I saw well, my girls. I said, hang on a second. What we need to do is actually while we're here, instead of just driving back on the highway, why don't we go off the routes and go and find these little things? And geocaching tends to help a lot with that. Okay, so you go looking for little treasures because they are finding South Africans' hidden, hidden treasures. And we went on and we did all of the Jock of the Bushveld stuff as well, right. as you were saying. So yes. that kind of thing, instead of like going, all right, I've got to go straight down the N3 to Durban to stop off somewhere. Okay. Taking these little journeys off the beaten track, how easy is it for you to try and follow in those footsteps? It depends which authors. Some authors are very easy uh, because they're literary societies or the Jock of the Bushfelt um, Society in the Lowfelt or the Herman Charles Bosman Society in Groot Mariko. And these people are passionate about the novels mm -hmm. and they're passionate about their, their little projects. And so they're only too happy to, to help you. And so some of these trips were really easy where it was handed to me on a plate and I, I simply needed to follow in, in along routes that were already provided for me. Mm. For others, like with J.M. Kutsia's Murdenar's Karoo, I had to try and get to J.M. Kutsia's cousin's farm, Fontaine, way off the beaten track, couldn't find out where it was. And that becomes more like forensic, uh, for, forensic literary travel. Mm -hmm. So that it's, it was a mixed bag. Which has been your favorite? Not just from the, the author point of view. But the actual travel point of view? That would be the, the final chapter, the Stephen Watson Cedarburg chapter. And that's because the Cedarburg is sort of heartland for me. Mm -hmm. It's close to Cape Town and I go up there quite regularly. And walking in those mountains on my own, um, staying in little huts is for me, that's proper soul travel. Mm -hmm. And I respond to the Cedarburg in a similar way to what Stephen did with his poetry. So for my personal favorite, that would be the one. Okay, I'm I'm sitting and thinking immediately as you're speaking, and that, it's a weird thing that I found out that you know when some people can't recognize people's faces, they have what was prosopagia, whatever. There's some people who cannot imagine in their mind's eye what places look like when they read about them or if people talk about them. But with this one, it brings up so many incredibly intense emotions when you're reading about a specific area, especially if you've been to the area before. How difficult is it to actually try and translate that into words that will bring that feeling to people who have maybe not even been to the area before? Having been at Getaway Magazine for 20 years, that helps because so much of what I was trying to do in all that journalistic writing was to go to a wonderful exotic place, be it in Mozambique or Zimbabwe or Botswana, and to try and convey to the readers the, the sights, the smells, the sounds, the tastes – and most importantly, the atmosphere, the, the soul or the spirit of a place. And so my literary project since I started in 1998 with travel writing was exactly that. Mm. And so what this book does is I'm, I'm sort of plugging into and jazzing off great authors who've been trying to do exactly the same thing, trying to evoke those lands landscapes. So it's kind of a combination of my life's project and then using great authors and, and seeing how they respond to a landscape and then me responding to their response. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting dialogue between me and an author, but also me and the characters, because I'm very interested in how Wimskalk Lawrence responds to the landscape as much as Herman Charles Bosman. So there are three layers to the project. That's quite an interesting way of looking at it. I mean, like, yes, I'm suddenly thinking, I only think about it from my own point of view when I think about a place. But now I'd be looking at it from your point of view, from the author's point of view, and from the character's point of view, and yes. my point of view too. So yes. you've got four layers to so it. So for the reader, there are four layers. Yes. yes. Okay, so you talk about spirit. Now, as a gardener, we're always trying to incorporate some kind of spirit into a garden. So it's not just like a kind of a lawn with some trees in it and it's got no kind of heart in it. And a garden is very much an encapsulation of a larger landscape. Okay, so where do you think this whole idea of spirit 
comes from? Is it just from the people or do you think that there's something, <laughs> it sounds a bit esoteric. Is there something else out there in nature which actually kind of really bombards human beings with it or is it just our response to it? I, I think it is our response to it, but I do think there are certain places that ha- just everybody responds to it, that there's a, there's a certain conjunction of stuff in that place, whether it's the fauna or the flora or the topography or the light or, or the way a little village sits in the land that people instinctively respond, mm. respond. And this is to the, the history of humankind, whether you look at the aboriginals in Australia and, and, and sacred sites and, mm. the, and Welsh and their, their sacred forests or, or Native American Indians in North America. They're specific places that, that they feel is charged with spirit and with a particular quality. None of that's gone away. We as human beings still respond like that to particular environments. I'm in a little camp in the Bushveld in the Kruger Park or whatever, and I'm on fire. It just, it just, mm. the response is instinctive. It's almost an animal response. And I think that's what each of these authors have felt in each of these landscapes. And that's what makes the writing so powerful. Well, I think you can find those even in the cities. I mean, I drive up, there's a, a little kind of thing through a cliff, a neck going up near um, Rodeport. And I think it's just the way that the mountains, the little hills come down. And you find them on the way to Sun City along the side of the road, just these little places. And I think, oh, I'd like to build a house there. Yeah, It just has something that really does speak to you. Are there any places in South Africa that you haven't been to that you think, oh, I haven't explored that enough yet? Or have you been, like I have pretty much, except for Springbok, been everywhere? Yeah, I think as a getaway journalist, you get everywhere. Every every month a different assignment. So I think I've done most of what I would want to do in South Africa. I can't th- the, B- the Baviance Kloof was the last one that I didn't have on my list, and mm-hmm. I did that two or three years ago. And right now I think I've t- ticked most of the boxes of my bucket list, but you know that you always want to go back. It's never enough, and, mm-hmm. and, and so I keep going back to the places I love and will do for the rest of my life, I'm sure of that. So have you been also, like, I mean, going up to Sudwana to go diving there and yes. gone ziplining in the uh, nice the forests and things like yes, that? Yes, yes. No, I've done all the – all the regular stuff, the, the stuff that most um, getaway readers would have done, I would have had to have done in my career somewhere along the way. It sounds like you had an absolutely blessed life. I mean, the, the, we do have the most incredible country. I mean, I love it. And still today, traveling anywhere, I get really excited about going and finding something new. And I would, you know, I wouldn't be able to write about it like you do. I might write it from a point of trees, but that's yes. about it because I'm yes. always looking for, for good trees as well. So if somebody else kind of wanted to take a – literary journey, which would be the one that you'd say to them, take first, out of the ones that you've gone through in this book? I suppose it's, it depends where you live. And if you live in Gauteng, I would say the, the Herman Charles Bosman would be the quickest and easiest. It's, it's two hours to the Mariko. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a wonderful landscape and they're wonderful stories. And, and you'll probably already know them just instinctively. You will have done them at school or you will have seen Patrick Maynard doing a skit. So it's already in your blood. So you'll respond to that landscape almost instinctively. Mm-hmm. And also if you're in Gauteng, the, the other two close chapters are Eugene Maria, Maria's Waterberg, also two hours to the north. Mm-hmm. And, and Sir Percy Fitzpatrick's Jock of the Bushveld. It's three hours to the east down to to Leidenberg which is where the old wagon route starts. Okay so you've got the Cedarburg you've got those ones you've got the Eastern Cape where are the other ones? So there's Neisner Forest that's Dalian Matir circles in, circles in, a, in forest. a forest yeah. There's Kringa the Nibos. Kringa Nibos, exactly. Yeah. Then there's Zaxum Dar's Heart of Redness which is the wild coast around the Kai River mouth area. A oh, nice area as well. It's a lovely area mm. and then obviously um Olive Shriner's Craddock area. And then in the central, the Murdenars Karoo, which is sort of near Leo Khamka. Okay, That's explain Kutsia. that to me. Okay. okay, I need to know exactly because the Karoo is an area which I really enjoy. And I'm, in fact, I'd go and live there in a heartbeat, to be honest with you. Whereabouts is that exactly? Because it's a people don't realize how big the Karoo is. Is it in the yeah. Tankwa Karoo? Is it no. in the Klein Karoo, the Khrut Karoo? It's, it's just west of Beaufort West. So it's that's er- that area. Oh, okay. So on your way down the N1 towards Cape Town. Yes. So if you're going Joburg to Cape Town, after Beaufort West, it would be the, the area on your right before you get to sort of Mikey's Fontaine and, and, oh, yes, and Lanesburg. Okay. Uh, that's the Murdenas Karoo, also known as the Coop, K-O-U-P. So what happened there? 
There are lots of stories why it's called the Murdenos Karoo, but I think it's just because it's the driest part of the Karoo. But that's the 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 uh, Michael K. Life and Times of Michael K. So that's J.M. Coutier's famous. He's I'd say his finest novel, certainly mm. my favorite novel, and it's kind of set loosely set around his old family farm, which is called Full Fontaine. Which is off the N1 near Merveville, which is near Leo Chamka. It's, okay. it's, it's, it's a, <laughs> never it's, heard of that one. <laughs> it's the back end of nowhere. Yeah. And so I went to visit the farm, met James Kutsia's cousin and tried to walk in the footsteps of his most famous character, Michael Kay. Mm. And that was a very powerful trip for me because I, lo- that's probably my favorite South African novel. And to actually be on that farm and, and sort of walk in the footsteps of the main character was very special indeed. Are there any authors that you haven't done who have written about places that you would still like to go, even like, you know, from that time ago or contemporary people? Yeah. I mean, this, the list goes on and on. And I had to be, I had to be rigorous about uh, choosing just a few, but I had thought of Cry the Beloved Country and Alan Payton, mm-hmm. uh, Ikopo, and then up through the Midlands to Johannesburg because KwaZulu Natal doesn't feature doesn't much. Doesn't feature, yeah. yeah. And that's another area which I'm very, very fond of. Yeah. And then there's Craig Higginson's new novel, The, the Ghost of Sam Webster, which is Midlands and Fugitives Drift and Zululand. That would also be for for the next book. That's God's own country. Yeah. yeah. And then there's Saul Plyke's Mafeking, which is another one that mm. would be certainly possible if I ever wrote a sequel. Well, I think that it behooves you to actually put another one together because this is so exciting. And I mean, I just love the idea of going on a journey in your mind, but having it done in, in so many different layers. Because I think if you're given to travel – that your mind will always go back to those places. And I know that you, you went to Greece and that's where your, your book starts is with the family in Greece and the, the feeling that you got and, and having just watched the Durrells on the heat streaming television somewhere and, and looking at their life story in Greece as well. I mean, I was sitting and thinking, you know, and I spent a lot of time in Greece too. It's like six months or so sailing yachts all over the place. So immediately when I read that of yours or when I watched what they were doing, I immediately was back there again. I could smell it. I could feel it. I can remember exactly how I felt, what I was reading, what I was doing. Do you have that as well when you go back to places or think about them? Yes, I do. I do. And I re-inhabit places through literature. So mm. if a place really touches me, I, I read everything I can about it, either before I, or w- before I go again. So if I'm going to Greece, I'll certainly be reading the Durrells and Patrick Lee Firmer and so on. Mm. So I, I love the marriage of, of landscape and literature, and it gives you such a rich response to a landscape. I think the people that capture a landscape in the most interesting complex, sophisticated ways are authors. Painters do it beautifully. If you think of a Pyrenee of painting of the South African landscape, incredible. Mm. Um, musicians do it. You know, just a simple song can evoke a landscape in a most beautiful way. But if you want the real, the people that are plumbing the, the most interesting intellectual depths and describing landscapes in the most evocative way, it's to literature you you must turn. Mm. Um, and they're taking the facts of geography, of geology, of fauna and flora and history and cultural anecdotes, and they're marrying them into a web that is utterly beautiful and can stay with you for life. And you can read it again and again each time you go to those landscapes and maybe get something new each time. But there is something very evocative about South African travel. I wouldn't say maybe just travel books. I, I go back to the original Africana where you had your explorers, you had your um, naturalists, you had like, you know, Love Viant doing the birds and um, the people, they had the missionaries, you had the hunters and like Baines with all of those beautiful books, which most of us will never get to see because they're in private collections and they cost an absolute fortune. But that has always been something which has garnered people to go overseas from overseas but you have two types of people people who will only ever read about it and then people who will do it the traveling like you've done why do you think that there is this huge discrepancy between people who stay put like i mean we were saying before we started recording that i've been living in the same house since i was 13 and my families have lived in their houses since my children my parents were children and they've been in the family the whole time and those people who have not gone very far to having is this a new generation of people that are traveling more? I mean, we know that there were all the travelers that happened, like you know, in the, the eras of discovery. Okay, but do you think it's more of a natural thing for people to stay home, or more of a natural thing for people to travel? 
I think it's a natural uh, inclination to travel. and But I do think you need to travel when you're quite young to get the bug. So people who, who, who grow up in a, on a farm and perhaps never travel, then they don't necessarily have the bug. Mm. But once you've got the bug, it never goes away. You, you, you constantly need to travel. But, but humans are a traveling species. That's how we colonized the globe. globe. Homo sapiens was able to, was able to move and wanted to move and was always since the dawn of time, interested in what's over the horizon. So it's de- definitely in our blood. We are a nomadic species. Mm. Do, well, Neanderthals not so much. They stayed put a lot more than sa- sapiens did. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, sapiens wanted to move yeah. and wanted to explore. So what, what is the next book that you're working on now? Apart from the, obviously thinking about the second, the, <laughs> the sequel to this particular one. Yes, I'm doing a series of Second World War novels, and I've got two that are out, The Cape Raider and The Wolf Hunt, and mm. the next one is in production, and it, it's about Tobruk and El, El Alamein in North Africa. So my father and all my uncles fought in those battles. And in my the granddad, West. too, at El Alamein as well, yeah. Right. And so uh, book three will be set in Alexandria. I've been reading a lot of Lawrence Durrell to get, to get into the spirit of Alexandria and I traveled to Alexandria went to the battlefield at El Alamein saw all the burnt out tanks mm-hmm. and so that is book three and then book four will be within the series as a, as a convoy to Malta in 1942 so I'm sort of steeped in Second World War history and fictionalizing it but but sticking pretty close to the historical facts and inserting my characters and my ships into those battles But how do you do that when I mean you didn't grow up and is it just from listening to other people talking about it from reading a lot about it because it, I mean, it was a totally different world in the way of everybody thought. Way of living is so completely different to how it was in those days. And the, even the structural societal norms that pervaded everything. I mean, that is also so different. How do you manage to get yourself into that headspace? It's tons and tons of research. Before I wrote the first book, I spent four years researching, and a lot of it in, in London, in the Imperial War Museum, mm. the National Archives at Kew, the British Library, the Bodleian Library, Portsmouth uh, Naval History Museum, Greenwich Naval History Museum. So I, yeah, I completely inserting myself into the time and place, and I read newspapers of the era. Mm. I listen to the music of the time. I listen to Vera Lynn and Lily Marlene and, 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 uh, Frank Sinatra to try and get the spirit of the place. And then I visit each location. So the first two novels are set in Simonstown. I did my national service in the Navy in Simonstown. My family have a, an old beach cottage down there. So I spend a lot of time in Simonstown, in the Naval Museum, in the archives there. So that's book one and two. And book, book three was Alexandria and Egypt. So I went and spent a few weeks there. And then book four is Malta. And I've just come back from Malta where I spent a few weeks in their archives and, and interviewing old people who lived through the siege and, and then trying to just walk those streets and imagine I'm in 1942. Because it's quite a range of, of um, genres that you've gone through here. I mean, like war, taking adventures through landscapes, children's books, poetry, what, what, what. Where would you like to go that you haven't been and to do something about that. And what would be the main reason for wanting to go there? I know this is a, like a, throwing out a big question here. Yeah, yeah. In terms of travel, I've never, never done South America and, and I've never been to Antarctica. So to maybe to go Argentina or Peru and get on a ship and go down to Antarctica. I mean, that, that's for my sort of bucket list travel. Mm-hmm. I'd love to go there. But then the literary projects are, are often more complicated projects. And w- one of the idea, ideas I have is to, is to get a Land Rover and drive around the rim of the Mediterranean and do two books. Um, one would be looking at Africa's influence on, on Europe mm-hmm. around the rim of the Mediterranean. And the second would be the Europe's, Europe's Europe, influence on Africa. Yeah, yeah. But looked, looked at from the perspective of a road trip around the edge of the Mediterranean. That would be an enormous project. And I'd, Need a lot of money, and if you've got any sponsors, and you need a co-driver, <laughs> and a co-driver, <laughs> and a lot of time, that yeah. would be, a, you know, the, the research for that would be a couple of years, and the journey would be a long journey. There's a lot of people though who, I mean, have done that just around South Africa, and like um, I've got a friend who, first of all, did all the way around the coast of Af- of South Africa, then she did all the way around. Africa on the outsides as well. Right. So they're wonderful people who take these trips and they're just talking about what they're doing. But the, doing it this way, having a, a thing that grounds it to actually hook it in first of all, like you've done with um, this particular book, Place, it, it really kind of adds an added 
impetus to actually going and doing it, not just traveling for travel's sake and seeing how far it is till you get there, but to actually go on a mission. Are yeah. you very mission driven? Or do you just travel for travel's sake sometime as well? No, I'm mission driven. I normally have a project at the back of my head. So when I travel, I'm normally writing hard, photographing hard and reading hard to try and experience the landscape to the full. And that's not necessarily always the most relaxing kind of trip. So then I, I do have to do trips where I switch off. And that's to go back to a pla- places that I love and have been going to from childhood. And I've, I've kind of worked through them and I don't need to write about them. And I don't need to think too hard about them to go and sit in a beach house on Longabon Lagoon or Arniston or, or in the Cedarburg. I don't have to rework those projects so mm. I can, then I can sit You're around my relax. bri fire with my burra bors and my chop and my glass of wine and not, and not have to write. Yeah. I just, I feel quite sorry for the youth of today from the point of view that I think, well, I mean, I, I think I'm a bit older than you. Then when we got to travel when we were younger, it was a much safer world to travel around in. That traveling now for young people could be fraught with all kinds of dangers that they're not going to have the same experiences, not just like, I mean, their everyday experiences of life anyway. It's so different to what we didn't have, where they locked into their little worlds of technology, whereas we went out to go and find stuff and travel and get away from our parents. Now it's changed. Do you you think that there are still lots of places that kids can go to young? I'm not talking about like young kids, obviously, but like, you know, sort of late teens, early twenties, that it's still a good place. And where would you suggest that the starting point for them should be if they're coming out of South Africa, whether it's in South Africa or somewhere overseas? Yeah, of course, the South Africa of today is, is, is quite a dangerous place for, for young people to, to go meandering around. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think Europe is still really safe for, for that kind of gap year for the, the late teenager, early twenties. It's, you can still walk alone at night in many European cities uh, and still feel fairly safe. But in South Africa, the thing is to get it far off the beaten track. Mm. You don't want to be wandering around lonely as a cloud in, in a big city at night. But, but if you're out in these little villages in, in the Platteland, you, you're safe uh, and, and, and it's wonderfully rewarding. And, and you're getting back to nature as well, which is so important for the youth of today who are buried in their computers and their screens. Instead of in books. Instead of in books. Which is what they should be with this one specifically. Exactly. My, my twins are going to have to watch uh, to read this. <laughs> what about the idea of actually make? Uh, when I was reading through it, I was like, this would make such an amazing like um, TV series. Yes, Yes, it, I, I could Any go and do. On that? I could go and do it all again. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, yeah, it would be it would be wonderful to to turn this into something visual. Uh, definitely, it's a big project because these are long distances. I mean, if if you retracing Jock of the Bushveld or Danaise's Raids's ride from the Free State through the Southern Cape and up to Springbok in the Northern Cape, these are these are long journeys, big projects, big budget. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah. I'm game. There are these things called helicopters. They get you anywhere. <laughs> yeah, but that's cheating. <laughs> no, it's not. You have the te- send the team there, and you get there, and everything's in all. Well, if you decide to do it, I'm your girl. Great. Okay, so where can people find your book? Is it in all good bookshops online, everywhere that are normal places? Yeah, all the normal, all the normal bookshops and online. Um, yes. And being published by Penguin Random House. And it's 320 South African rot. And I think that would be a very good buy for something that can give you so many good memories and some new insights into not only our beautiful country, but also to the people who describe it so incredibly well, including Justin himself. Thank you so much for joining us in the reading room today. And um, please let us know when the next book is coming out, um, although it's about war, which is not my favorite way of looking at things. I've, I prefer peace. <laughs> and let's hope that it'll be a peaceful trip for you on the next one that you take as well. Thank you so much, Melanie. And don't forget, of course, you can find out about lots of other South African writers and authors and people who write about writing or write about the English language and other episodes of The Reading Room. We'll catch you again soon. Bye. You've been listening to another production from Solid Gold Podcasts.